dive in. Welcome, good afternoon. My name's Lori Ward. I'm CEO at Washington's National Park Fund. We're glad you're with us here today. Uh, WNPF raises millions of dollars every year for our national parks. And we're having a very good year this year, thankfully, in light of everything that's underway in our nation and around the world. Uh, today, we're gonna talk bears up in the North Cascades. We're gonna steer away from the topic of the grizzly bears and everything that's gone on over the last few years. You can learn more about that by going to North Cascades National Parks website, but that's not the purpose of our visit with Dave today. He's gonna to educate us on bears, and I personally am very fascinated. I remember years ago when my husband and I first hiked in, the, um, in Glacier National Park, and everywhere we went, we saw the bear warnings. And I was probably 25, and I was like, oh my goodness. And it was just so exciting in a way, but also nerve wracking. And all of you can relate to that. You can remember back to a time when you have been in parks where bears are. So with that, I am happy to have Dave Hersey with us here today. Dave's an interpretive ranger up in North Cascades National Parks. He's been with the National Park Service for quite some time and has had some great experiences across our country. So with that, Dave, welcome. We're glad you're with us here today. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. And uh, I'm gonna turn it on over to you, Dave. Thanks for being here. All right. Well, hello, my name is Ranger Dave and welcome to the North Cascades. I wanted to start off by asking a question. In one word, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word bear? Now, I've done bear safety talks around the country for many years, and I've asked this question a lot, and I get a wide array of answers. So I've heard things like beauty, nature, love, admiration, fear, survival, and empathy. So today, during the program, I would like for you to think about what bears mean to you and what bears mean to our landscape, and thus what bears mean to our national parks. Bears are a very, very important part of our ecosystem uh, that we have to coexist with. Today, we're gonna learn how to coexist with bears in the wild for their safety as well as ours. So the primary bear we have here in North Cascades is the black bear. Uh, there may be some grizzlies here in the park. We really don't know. However, the last grizzly bear spotted here was in 1996, so that's been quite some time ago. We're going to start off discussing the bear's habitat and how they survive and how they've adapted to survive. This will give us some insight into how bears react the way they do in certain circumstances. Uh, also, we'll be discussing things we can do to protect bears and prevent bad bear behavior. Most of the time, it's bad human behavior that gets bears into trouble. And lastly, we're going to talk about what to do during a bear encounter. So it looks like we've already started the slideshow. I wanna start off by getting the audience active and participating in this program. So we're gonna start off with a poll, and this may seem like a dumb question, but what color are black bears? So the answers that we have uh, for that uh, are black, of course, uh, blue, black, brown, dark brown, cinnamon, white or silver, or A, all of the above. So we're gonna give you about 20 or 30 seconds to respond to that poll and see what you come up with. Okay, 21% of you said black bears are black. 6% uh, said they're blue, black. 2% of you said they were brown. 10% say they're dark brown. 0% said they were cinnamon. And 2% said they're white or silver. And 58% of you said uh, all, of the, all the above. Well, the correct answer is all of the above. So why are black bears called black? It's because when the first settlers came over from Europe and they landed uh, here on the East Coast, all the black bears were black. The majority of bears uh, east of the Gla uh, Great Plains are black bears. So that's how they got their common name, uh, black bears. But black bears come in more colors than any other North American mammal. 
So let's go to slide number two. I, I think we're on that now. Uh, there is no doubt that bears are very important to the functioning of the ecosystem. Bears perform several essential functions. Bears are omnivores, which means they eat both plants and animals. This is essential to the habitat. When bears eat plants, they ingest seeds, and bears wander great distances. When bears poop out these seeds, new plants begin to grow in areas where they may not have grown before. The seeds also have fertilizer dispersed with them. These new plants and new areas attract new animals who eat them. In short, bears are what we call habitat engineers in that they are responsible for creating biodiversity and new habitats. Next time you're hiking and enjoying uh, the diversity of plants and animals in the North Car Cascades, in part, thank a bear. Slide number three, please. Bears are also at the top of the food chain and are known as a keystone uh, species because they have a great effect on our ecosystem. And without them, the ecosystem would change or suffer. Being omnivores, bears also uh, eat animals and contribute to keeping animal populations under control. Without control, other species could grow uh, to large numbers in overgraze areas that could decimate food sources for other animals and decrease the biodiversity in the area. Bears in the North Cascades tend to rely more on plants and berries and insects and fish. So there are more berries and bucks. What a bear actually eats mainly depends on the habitat and what food source is available and when. Slide four, please. Consequently, bears are really miracles of evolution. Bears have adapted to survive harsh winters when food is scarce. Have you ever been really, really hungry? How did that make you feel? Well, bears do not eat or drink for the uh, four to six months that they're in hibernation. Hibernation is basically a deep, deep sleep. Slide five, please. Bears often live, uh, live off the stored fat in their bodies. To help the stored energy last longer, a bear's metabolic process slows down. Their breathing and heart rate slow while still maintaining body temperature. Black bears can lose up to 20% of their body weight during hibernation. So just to give you an idea of the body temperature, uh, normal body temperature for a black bear is anywhere from 98.6 to about 100.4 normal, but they kind of maintain that during hibernation. So the typical <clears throat> temperature for a bear, black bear during hibernation is 86 to 97 degrees. But what is really, really amazing is that normally a bear at rest takes somewhere uh, eight to 12 breaths per minute and 40 to 80 breaths per minute when it's overworked or looking for food or running. But during hibernation, uh, they only breathe one to two times per minute. Now, if you were a human and you only uh, breathe uh, four times a minute, I think that's pretty close to being legally dead. You, you would be in trouble. Uh, <clears throat> normally, a bear's, black bear's heartbeat is about somewhere in the neighborhood of 84 beats per minute, but during hibernation, it slows down to 19 beats per minute. This is how bears have adapted uh, to survive. <coughs> Excuse me just one second. Got a coughing spell here. So consequently, bears are really miracles of evolution. Uh, they've adapted to survive uh, the very harsh winters. So as you might imagine, uh, bears are famished when they wake up in the spring. Can we go to slide number six, please? Bears have little time to fatten up before the next hibernation cycle. Bears are like a garbage disposal. They'll eat almost anything. Uh, this is how they gain their second scientific name, Oedipus almost anything of us. Uh, that's just kind of a joke. Can we go to the uh, video of the bear, please? Okay, what bears eat and when depends on the habitat and food sources available at different times of the year. In the spring, bears enjoy insects, roots, grubs, and they scavenge on carrion and fish and small mammals and seeds and grasses. In late summer, when the berries are ripe, bears can be seen grazing on blueberries or huckleberries. During the fall, bears eat nonstop. They have to gain weight for winter and hibernation. This is called hyperphasia. 
During hyperphasia, bears in the North Cascades eat a lot of huckleberries. They need to take in about 20,000 uh, calories uh, per day. So that's kind of like eating seven huckleberry pies a day to keep up with that uh, caloric intake that they need. So bears often get into trouble when they go after human food. Uh, slide number seven, please. Human food is tasty and is often an easy meal, thanks to humans. Uh, slide seven. Human food has things in it that are tasty to us and to bears, such as fats and sugars. These processed fats and sugars are no good for us and even worse for the bears, but it tastes good and it's high in calories. Human food also contains preservatives, sodium, high fructose corn syrup, and other things that are not good for bears or us as well. Proper storage of food and attractants is essential to a bear's survival. Whether by design or accident, a fed bear is a dead bear, because more often than not, a food-conditioned bear has to be killed. Uh, I've made a short little video about camping with bears in bear country to further educate you, so if we could go to that video, please. Therefore, by reducing the access bears have to human food, we can keep bears healthier and make our interactions safer with them. When bears get human food, they associate humans with food. This is called food conditioned. These bears quickly become a problem because they will do anything to get human food, including breaking into vehicles, tents, and wandering into campsites and campgrounds in search of human food. Bears can also become aggressive towards humans. A large percentage of bear attacks can be traced back to bears obtaining human food. More often than not, food conditioned bears have to be killed. This is why we say a fed bear is a dead bear. Obviously, we do not want a bear to lose its life over something we have done, and consequently, we do not want to be injured or lose our life over something that we or other humans have done. The key to negative bear encounters is prevention. Bears are attracted to anything that smells. That includes food, cosmetics, petroleum products, toothpaste, deodorant, soap, and even washed dishes. Here are some tips for storing food in front country established campgrounds. Use bear-proof boxes or a hard-sided camper or a vehicle to store these kinds of items. Keep your campsite clean and properly store garbage. Food storage in our backcountry campsites can be a bit more challenging. Bear food storage boxes are provided in some of our backcountry campsites. However, bear canisters are required in some backcountry sites and cross-country zones. You are welcome to bring your own canister as long as it's on the approved list by the interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. When bear canisters are not required, hanging food from a tree is a great way to keep food out of the mouths of bears. Proper hanging requires the food be hung at least 12 feet above the ground and at least 5 feet on the limb away from the tree trunk. Remember to bring at least 50 feet of rope with you to accomplish this. Never store your food in or around your tent, whether attended or unattended. The campsite triangle is a great way to set up camp for safety. Basically your tent, your food, your cooking area are set up in a triangle 100 yards apart. However, this may not be feasible in all backcountry campsites. For more information on camping in bear country, please visit www.nps.gov backslash NOCA. Four. All right. Slide number eight, please. Okay, let's take another poll to get you guys interactive here. Um, can we bring up the poll, please? So, where is the largest concentration of black bears in the lower 48? So, our choices are North Cascades in Washington, Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina, or the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula in North Carolina, or the Catskill Mountains in New York. So, again, we'll give you about 20 or 30 seconds to complete this poll. All right, let's see what we've got here. So for the North Cascades, 
we have 34% of you saying that's where the largest concentration is. And 40% said Yellowstone, wow. Uh, the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina is 22%. Uh, the Albemarle Pamlico Sound in North Carolina, 2%. And the Catskill Mountains, New York is 2% as well. Well, the answer to that is Albemarle Pamlico Sound in coastal North Carolina. That is kind of amazing. I used to work near there in Cape, uh, Cape Hatteras. And that's kind of a fun little fact that I learned uh, while visiting over there in the uh, Alligator River National Refuge. All right, so can we go to the next slide, please? Um, slide number nine. All right, we need to keep ourselves safe in bear country as we rec uh, recreate. There's several things we can do to prevent a bear attack or a negative encounter by a bear. Your chance of being attacked by a bear is extremely rare. Um, more people die of uh, bee stings in the United States than they do of bear attacks every year. So there's several things we can do to keep ourselves safe. One, we can hike in groups of four or more. In North America, there's never been a bear attack of a group of four or more. This is because bears can better hear and smell you and large groups are int uh, intimidated, uh, intimidate bears. So carry bear spray. It's kind of a personal choice here in the North Car uh, Cascades. Uh, my point of view, it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Uh, but you never know. That's totally up to you. It's not a rule. It's not a requirement. Uh, so if you do carry bear spray, you want to be familiar with it. You want to practice getting it out of the holster. Uh, you want to read the instructions. Bear spray is a type of pepper, uh, pepper spray that uses an active ingredient of uh, ground cayenne peppers. It's called oleo resin capsicum. It is generally in lower concentrations than that of bear spray or uh, pepper spray used in self-defense. Bear spray has typically 1.8 to 2% oleo resin capsicum in it. And bear spray makes it very difficult for the bear to breathe. It affects the mucous membranes and it stings like heck. So we don't want to incapacitate the bear with a higher concentration. We just want it to go away. So bear spray is also 90% effective. Can we go to slide 10, please? So when you're hiking, it's very, very important to make lots of noise so you don't surprise a bear or trigger an attack. So if the trail is windy and you're coming around the corner, you don't want to surprise that bear there. Bears gener uh, in general want to get away from people. If they hear you coming from a distance, it gives a bear time to get away. Now you see a lot of people on the hiking trails using bear bells. These are not sufficient. Number one, they don't make enough noise. Bell bear, bell, can't speak today. Bear bells are discouraged because bears have come accustomed to hearing these bells on hikers and they associate that with food in a backpack. So it's kind of like ringing the dinner bell. So you definitely don't want to use those. So you want to talk loud, you want to shout, you can clap your hands when you're walking, say, hey bear, hey bear, or you can sing a song uh, very loudly. One of my friends, Ranger, uh, Ranger Paisley, has came up with a bear song, and we've got a little video of her bear song. So if we could go to the video, please. Hey bear, ho bear, what you gonna do? I'm here, you're there, I'm just passing through. Hey bear, ho bear, such a lovely day. This is your land, I understand, and I'll be on my way. Okay, slide number 11. Uh, it's, Im <coughs> it's important to keep your distance from a bear. A good rule of thumb is to stay at least 100 yards away. Uh, let's take another poll. Okay, so how fast do you think a football player can run 100 yards? Is it 10 seconds, 15, 18, or 21? And again, we'll give you 20, 30 seconds.
All right, for the 10 seconds, 22% of you said 10 seconds, 31% said 15, 26% said 18 seconds, and 20% said 21 seconds. So bears can charge up to 35 miles an hour. And the reason we ask you this is because a football field is about 100 yards, right? And we're recommending that you stay at least 100 yards away from bears. And the reason is, the answer to that poll, by the way, is anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds. So I think the fastest football return at 105 yards was like 10.8 seconds, something like that. Well, at 100 yards, a bear can charge at 35 miles an hour. He can cover that in 5.8 seconds. The point being, number one, don't run from bears. He's going to outrun you. Uh, number two, that 100 yards distant is the point we're trying to make. So if you're 100 yards from a bear and a bear does charge you, you've got 5.8 seconds to do something about it or think about what you're going to do or to get your bear spray out, right? So if you're less than 100 yards, say you're 50 yards, then you've got half, a time, half the time. So you've got something like 2.8 seconds to three seconds to figure out what you're gonna do. So it's very important to give bears their space. And when you're around bears, uh, you wanna avoid crowding around bears to take photos and things like that. The bear needs an escape route. And if the bear doesn't have escape route, it could feel pretty threatened. So that's the reason we recommend 100 yards. And by the way, photographers have a very high rate of uh, bear attacks because they get too close to take a photo. Just remember that photo is not worth you getting injured over and it's not worth the bear, uh, or, uh, the bear getting injured or killed over as well. So can we go to uh, slide number 12, please? It's important to be aware of your surroundings. If you see cubs, mama bear is not far away. Watch and smell for dead animal carcasses in the area that bears may feed upon. Look for a congregation of vultures or crows or ravens in the area. Uh, again, that's a sign that there's a carcass in the area. Bears are very, very protective of their food. Uh, very important, keep your pets on a leash and keep young children near you. Can we go to slide number 13, please? Okay, running and bicycling in bear country are not good activities for several reasons. Number one, you're moving way too fast to be aware of your surroundings, situational awareness, right? Uh, also, bears have a predatory prey chase instinct. So when you're running by the bear, what does the bear think? It thinks you're prey. So it's not a good idea to go running or jogging on trails. Uh, in light of doing all the right things to keep ourselves safe, what do we do when we encounter a bear? Can we go to slide number 14, please? Okay, thank you. If you encounter a bear and it doesn't see you or doesn't seem to notice you, uh, just back away and go in the opposite direction that you came. If the bear does notice you, pull out your bear spray and have it ready. Carry your bear spray where it's ready, uh, readily accessible. In the backpack really doesn't work. If you see the bear and it uh, looks like it's gonna charge you, you can't say time out, Mr. Bear. Let me get my backpack off and look for my bear spray. Uh, on your side in a holster is a good place to carry it. Uh, like we just illustrated, bear attacks or charges can happen in seconds and you'll not have a whole lot of time. So if you're in that group of, uh, or any group, whether it's four or more or not, you wanna to group together and you wanna wave your hands in the air. Uh, this lets the bear know you're human. Nothing else in the forest waves its arms like humans do, right? And we want to speak gently to the bear. Hey, Mr. Bear. Hey, Miss Bear. We're here. We're backing up. We're trying to get out of the area. Don't mess with us. And waving your arms also makes you look bigger. Um, you could say something like, you back up, please, Mr. Bear, nice bear, good bear, and back away. Never, ever turn your back on a bear and absolutely do not run. Like we said, that triggers the instinct in the bear, the predatory prey instinct. Slide 15, please. So there are two types of bear behaviors we have to be concerned with during a bear encounter. The type of behavior will dictate how you should react. The first type of behavior is uh, called a defensive bear. 
this is a bear that just wants you out of the area. Um, it may have cubs, it may be defending a food source, or it maybe it just wants to show its dominance. Uh, this type of bear typically doesn't want, uh, want to harm you. It just perceives you as a threat and it wants you out of the way. Slide number 16, please. The second type of bear behavior we need to be concerned with is predatory bear behavior, sometimes called a curious bear. A high percentage of predatory bear attacks are usually perpetrated by human habituated or food conditioned bears. This is why it's extremely important uh, that no bear receive human food. Predatory as well as defensive bears can be any bear species. However, a large percentage of predatory bear attacks are perpetrated by black bears. However, black bears are usually less aggressive than, the other, uh, than other types of North American bears. Case studies have shown that people who knew the difference between a defensive bear encounter versus a predatory bear encounter and acted accordingly had lesser injuries during the encounter. This is why it's extremely important to be able to uh, distinguish a defensive bear from a predatory bear. For more information about this, we don't have a lot of time to go into it today. Um, you can uh, visit our website at www.nps.gov backslash NOCA. And we're gonna have those websites up here for you in a second. So go to uh, slide number 17, please. All right, to summarize, bears are interesting creatures that liven up the landscape. Most people enjoy seeing bears on a trip to a national park. Not only are bears important to us, but they're very important to the ecosystem in which they live. It is up to each and every one of us to do our part to keep wild bears wild and not condition them to human food. This is for the survival of the bear and the ecosystem, and thus the health of our national parks. If you encounter a bear in the North Cascades complex, please report it to a ranger or give us a call at 360-854-7200, or you can shoot us an email at NOCA underscore information at nps.gov. These reports help us to identify what bears uh, are where in the park, and if bears are getting too close to humans and campsites. It's also to document their behavior uh, for future bear management strategies. So as we've discussed, bears often have to be killed due to mistakes or carelessness by humans. I'd like to leave you with a final thought. How would you feel if you knew you were responsible for the death of a bear? All right, we're gonna take some questions uh, now. We may not be able to get to everyone's question, but you had my personal uh, NPS address up there and you can email me with that. And just remember, we're talking about bears and bear behavior. I'm not a bear biologist, but I'll try to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Dave, nice job. Very interesting. A few comments before I jump in here, folks. If you have questions you'd like to ask Dave, please enter them into the Q&A box down at the bottom and we'll get to them. Few comments for you, Dave. Uh, I thought it was fascinating that bears breathe one to two times a minute during hibernation. That's just remarkable. Yeah, it is. They're miracles of evolution. No kidding. They've um, adapted to survive. Yes. Are bear boxes, you may have said this and I may have missed it, are bear boxes required up in North Cascades National Park? Uh, not bear boxes per se, but safe food storages. In some of our front country campsites, we uh, <clears throat> provide bear boxes. And in the back country, even some of those sites have bear boxes. And in certain cross country sections, uh, we re uh, when you're in the back country, we uh, require that you carry uh, bear canisters. And as of now, you can get those at the Wilderness Information Center down in Marble Mount, where you get your permit from. Great, thank you. I, while you were talking, I looked online at REI just to get a sense of uh, what a bear box costs for people's information. And it's anywhere from like 70 to $80, depending on the size. And they have a nice uh, bear canister basics video on their site. So if folks want to oh, learn great. more. Yeah, if they want to learn more about that, be sure to do that. I'm going to go to some of the Q&As that have come in. Uh, we don't typically carry bear spray for one of our guests while hiking in the Central Cascades. Why not? And should we when hiking? 
Uh, well, that is a personal choice. Um, it's a safety thing. As I said, um, my point of view, working in bear country for many years, you know, I've worked places like Yellowstone and you don't go take your garbage out without bear spray. So maybe it's just Ranger, Days, Ranger Dave's habit to carry it when he's out hiking. Uh, but it's a personal um, choice of yours. Like I said, there's never been a bear attack in the North Cascades and your chances of getting attacked were extremely rare. You've probably got a better chance of getting in a car accident. But would you want to be in your car without a seatbelt? Dave, tell us about the idea of playing dead uh, during a bear encounter. You know, what your thoughts are. And I know there have been some things that have gone on a couple of things over at Glacier where you mentioned uh, running and biking. People have run into bears and had serious encounters. What are your comments on how to play dead? Well, well sure, I can comment on that. Uh, as I said earlier, you can go to our website and it will give you further information. But playing dead or fighting back depends on what type of bear you're gonna encounter. So you do not wanna play dead with a predatory bear, uh, but with a defensive bear, you do wanna play dead. And a defensive bear will talk to you. It'll uh, growl, it'll huff, it'll puff, it'll make jaw popping sounds. It may paw the ground or slap trees. Like I said, this animal's defending cubs or a carcass or just wants to show its dominance and wants you out of the area. So you would treat that kind of bear, uh, both predatory and uh, defensive, uh, kind of the same at this point. You would group up into a group, you would get your bear spray out. And most of the time, uh, it's gonna be very unlikely uh, that that bear is gonna actually hit you and knock you down. It may charge you and veer off at the last second. We call that a bluff charge. But if a defensive bear um, that's doing these things I just described hits you and knocks you down, uh, you do want to play dead. If you have your backpack on, you want to keep that on. This is going to protect your back. You want to lay flat on your stomach. This is going to protect your vital organs. And you want to interlock your hands behind your uh, neck. This is going to protect your vertebrae right here. And play dead. Uh, studies have shown, case study after case study, that the person who plays dead during a defensive bear attack, their injuries are going to be way less um, as opposed to fighting back. Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah that's kind of, it's easy to say, but if I'm out there, uh, well, that's going to be hard to do. One of our guests wants you to repeat what you said about bear bells and their, their effectiveness. Can you sh go back to that? Yeah, course, yeah. Please? bear bells are not loud enough. Uh, they sound pretty. It sounds like Santa Claus is coming through the forest with his eight tiny reindeer, you know, the sleigh bells. Uh, but they just don't project enough noise. Like we said, clap your hands and say, hey, bear, hey, bear, or sing Paisley's song. You can go back and rewatch this and learn her song. But it's my understanding that some places are starting to ban bear bells because they bears will associate those bells with humans and food in the backpack. So it's kind of like ringing a dinner bell. Interesting. We have a question from a six-year-old who's with us today. Okay, great. Yeah. She wants to know, um, how in the heck can a bear run across a football field in five seconds with all of those trees? <laughs> well, typically bears are not always in trees. Our black bears, they do like the forest. That is their habitats where other bears like uh, plain open areas. Uh, but, you know, you could be on a trail that has an open space of over 100 yards where there's obviously no trees growing on the trail, or you could be in a, a mountain meadow where there are no trees. Uh, but bears are uh, really, really fast. They can charge up to 35 miles an hour or better. That's remarkable. Uh, if you're in the back country and you have one of the canisters, how do you store it? Where, what are your comments about what, where to put them? Okay, there's several things uh, you can do. Definitely do not put it in the tent with you. Uh, believe it or not, bears have a very good sense of smell and they can smell right through those bear canisters. So I would store it away from my tent. As you saw in the video uh, that I made, uh, the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle is kind of a triangle where you have your tent set up here and down here is your cooking area. And on the other end, downwind from your tent is where you store your bear, uh, bear canister. 
And if you can put that bear canister in your backpack and hoist it up a tree at least five feet away from the trunk and at least 12 feet off the ground, uh, that would be ideal. Thank you. Dave, you've talked a little bit about predatory, predatory versus defensive. What's the difference? How do we know? Uh, well, I think we've already gone over what a defensive bear will do. It'll talk to you. It'll make noise. It may growl, huff, puff. It's uh, hair it may stand up on the back of its neck. Its ears may be laid back as well. Just kind of like an angry dog you would see in the neighborhood. Uh, good analogy, if you're walking through your neighbor's dog uh, yard and its dog starts growling at you and its ears are back, uh, that's a defensive dog. It wants you out of the area. It's territorial, right? So the other type of bear, uh, it's not going to do any of those things. It's going to walk around. It's going to look at you. It's going to follow you on the trail. Uh, it's going to have no fear of you. So that's how you would tell the difference. I was um, hiking just outside of Colonial Creek by myself one day a couple years ago and went up rain, rainy pass, rainy lake, mm -hmm. and, and came back down and was wandering right along the beautiful creek there. And uh, I came around the corner and a black bear was just like 10 feet from me. And he was as startled as I was. You could see it. He just kind of reared back and turned and ran the other way. Boy, I'll tell you, that got my attention. That oh, yeah. So That's why you make a lot of noises, because you can't see around the trail sometimes. That's right. Uh, let me look at a few more questions here, Dave. Hold on just a sec. Okay. Thanks. Uh, when you see a bear, if you are in a situation where you see a bear attacking someone, what do you suggest? Uh, yeah, we would probably need a little bit more information on that. Um, it was, did you get there in time to see the bear, um, you know, what it was doing? I, I would probably say if you've got bear spray on you, definitely go help out the person with the bear spray. Uh, just remember where you're spraying it and what direction the wind is blowing in. Unfortunately, the victim in all this, they may get the brunt end of the bear spray as well. I've, I've been sprayed by the pepper spray several times. Um, it is pretty bad. It's uncomfortable, but it's um, better than, you know, the alternative. So I would say if you saw a person just knowing just that information only, and there's a lot of variables that go into that. So just based on the information, I'm coming around the corner, somebody's being attacked with a, uh, by a bear. If I've got a uh, bear spray, I'm going to use it. If I have a group of people, we're going to group together, we're going to holler, we're going to shout. Uh, we can throw rocks and sticks at the bear. Just be careful not to hit the person. But then again, that may be better than the alternative. Uh, so just make a lot of noise uh, and try and get the bear off the person. The last thing you want to do is that bear coming towards you. But typically, if you have a large group and the bear feels threatened, uh, it's going to go away. I'm moving away now from the Q&A to the chat box. We have a number of questions there too, Dave. So okay. uh, let's see. What type of fish do bears eat? And what do you know about their eating habits? And I know you mentioned berries. Uh, can you tell us more? Uh, yeah, so uh, mainly our bears in North Cascades eat um, mainly bugs and berries. Uh, they do eat fish. We do have runs of salmon that come up uh, the Skagit River and some of the tributaries there. And so it's kind of an opportun uh, opportunity for bears if they're able to catch those salmon and those fish. Uh, their chances are probably a little bit better uh, with salmon because they run in tight groups. Whereas, you know, if you've got rainbow or cutthroat trout, there may be one or two of those you see at a time. But when you've got a whole school of fish coming up, it's kind of easier to pluck a fish out like that. But typically that's not what they eat, but they do get those here. And it depends on the time of year and what salmon are running. I think we have all five species of salmon uh, that run up the Skagit here. You folks are asking about loud whistles or the air horns. Uh -huh. Do you have comments about the effectiveness of them startling the bear away from you? Oh, oh yeah, that is a very good question. I, I thank you for asking that question. I would not walk through the woods uh, blowing a whistle, you know, clap, sing the song. Uh, a whistle is very intrusive. Uh, you're supposed to be in wilderness and it's just way too loud. Yeah, will the bear probably hear you come in with that? Yeah, for about three miles away. Uh, the air horns I do not recommend. And the reason I don't recommend air, horn, 
air horns is that I'm a boat owner and I used to have an air horn on the boat. And what I found out, those air horns, if a bear's charging you, they are very, very unreliable. Half the time they don't work. Bear spray has been proven to be 90% effective uh, and there is no data on the air horns. So make loud noises, clap like I said, sing a song, uh, but as far as going through the forest blasting an air horn, I don't think your fellow hikers would be very, very happy with you. Uh, we have a six-year-old who has a very unique question. Very, okay. very good question. Can okay. bear see underwater? I'm sorry, what, what was the question? Can bears see underwater? I don't know. <laughs> I'll just be honest with you. I, I imagine they're mammals and they do swim. Uh, so I imagine they would be like us if we uh, stick our head under the water. Yeah, you can see, but it's going to be blurry. Uh, that's why when we scuba dive or skin dive, we have a mask to put that air barrier, air, air barrier between our eyes and the water and we can see and focus. So yes, I would assume they could, but probably not very well. I mean, I can't see well underwater, not, even in a clear swimming pool. Someone's wondering about urban bears, and we see quite a bit of that now as, as population spreads. Uh, can you, can, is there any difference between their behavior and bears in the wilderness? Uh, yes, I would say your urban bear probably uh, has lost its fear of humans because it's coming into uh, our habitat and it's looking for human food. Um, I don't know in particular what type of urban area you're talking about, whether it's a suburb or a city. I know coyotes get in the city as well, but when they're in there, they don't have a whole lot of their natural foods uh, that they would be eating. Uh, so these bears are typically removed from urban areas. Uh, they try and trap them and take them and put them back in the wild. Okay, and this is an interesting question. You said that bears, it's amazing to, to know that bears eat insects and berries. It's like, how do they amass the weight that they need? But they do. Do bears eat um, like cats? Someone's wondering. Bears can eat cats. <laughs> or will they eat small? Critters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh, Cats are kind of hard to catch. I guess if you could catch one and the bear was hungry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I don't see a lot of cats running around out here in the forest, uh, probably in an urban area. Uh, but no, our bears here in North Cascade, uh, small mammals, they like to eat ground squirrels as well. So some like chipmunks, things like that, uh, they'll burrow and you can see bears digging in the ground for those. And if the bear can catch those, but they're kind of hard to catch. So our black bears here, it's mainly just bugs, berries, roots, grubs, grasses, seeds, things like that. Um, pine cones, the pine seeds from pine cones. One of our guests shares that um, in relation to bear canisters, you can rent them from uh, Ascent Outdoors in Ballard for $8 okay. a night. Nice savings there. So thank you for that tip. And I know you addressed this, but one more time we want to ask, is a brown bear the same as a black bear? No. Uh, brown bear is another name for another North American species of bear. Uh, and brown bear typically comes from Alaska. They're the same as the grizzly bears that they have in Alaska, but a brown bear is typically a coastal bear, like from Kodiak Island or something like that. Uh, but they call all bears in Alaska brown bears, except for black bears and polar bears, of course. And your brown bears get a little larger because they are at the coast and they do eat a lot of salmon. So they've got that uh, high protein diet. So brown bears are typically a little bigger, but no, a black bear is a species and it can be brown, black, cinnamon, dark brown, but it's different than that other species. Thank you. And one more question. I know you talked a little bit about this, but someone's wondering again, where is the greatest concentration of black bears, bears in the um, United States? Okay, it's in North Carolina on the coast. It's Albemarle, <clears throat> Pamlico Peninsula. Uh, so it's a little peninsula that sticks out in Hyde in Washington County in North Carolina. And the Outer Banks are 30 miles out in the ocean past that. So it's right there on that little peninsula. And that's where the greatest concentration of black bears are. In the lower 48, I know some bear biologists in North Carolina say in the world. But I'm just sticking with the lower 48 today. 
It's interesting that so many people thought it was Yellowstone and I, you know, just hearkening to the media coverage that we see of wildlife in Yellowstone and, and the, the encounters that take place. I want to thank you, Dave. This has been really terrific today. And I know this is a, um, an important topic for all of us and, and beautiful creatures and yet deserve all the respect in the world. Uh, as we begin to wrap up, I want to mention that in the upcoming weeks to everyone, we are going to have a bird songs in the North Cascades two weeks from today. We've gone to every other week now in the fall. Uh, so tune in for that. You can learn more about the upcoming uh, virtual field trips on our website. There's some information there about what we've done over the past year, couple of years at, uh, for the national parks that we have the pr privilege of serving. Finally, I just want to thank you again, Dave. You did a terrific job, very, very informative. And I want to thank Sharon in the background for all the work that she does every, every week for these virtual field trips. So thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Take good care.